my mom was robbed from me and my family. And I think that in, in large part, it was due to some kind of toxic exposure in her environment. Like, How did you get into just like really studying and taking a deep dive into nutrition in general? Great starting place. So I, um, I, I started college on a pre-med track and that was because I had always been interested in, in health and nutrition and, and fitness. I was super passionate about those things. I, I wasn't an athlete. I just, I became interested in bodybuilding when I was in high school and I never aspired to be a bodybuilder. Um, but I, I just became really enamored with like the world of supplementation mm. and, um, those are fun times when you're just trying to be kind of jacked. <laughs> yeah. You're trying to figure it out and do your three sets of 10 and stuff like that. Yeah. Take and your I, creatine. A hundred percent. And I was like a shy, introverted computer nerd growing up in, in school. And I wasn't, you know, I didn't, I, I like, I didn't, um, identify with the athletes in my high school. And so when I saw like, I, I think it was like in, in Manhattan where I went to school, I stumbled into some mom and pop supplement store and the guy behind the counter was actually like really generous with his knowledge. And he loaded me up with all these like muscle rags, which, you know, in retrospect, we know we're all like marketing vehicles, right? But muscle does, rags? Yeah. Wait, what are muscle is, rags? Is that an actual <laughs> company or something? No, like the ma like magazines and like oh, these. Oh, mags. Got yeah. It. Muscle mags. Oh, I, I, I thought said rags. rags. Yeah. I did. No, I, I don't. In my head, I feel like that. Are they not ever referred to as that? Or Maybe is that, did I just York. make that up? I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. New York? Yeah. Maybe I just made it up on the fly. Maybe it's the most chuggy thing. I don't know. It's another or word. You just got to do the uh, the SoCal thing. Like, oh, you guys don't have that in NorCal. It's okay. Yeah, like, it's a SoCal thing. My bad. But like, um, <laughs> But like as an on-ramp into this world, I was very grateful at the time and they were super exciting. And um, I saw like the potions on the walls as being like portals really essentially mm. to, for, to help me transcend myself at the time. Mm. And uh, I became really interested in, in, in working out and, you know, I was seeing great like gains in the gym and I started to feel more confident in my body. And, uh, and I went to, I, I went into college aspiring to do something in the sciences, but Halfway through college, I realized that I was also creative. I was a storyteller. Mm. And, um, and that I, I always, look, just looking back on my academic career, I was never really that, like, that good. Because I would do good in the, I would excel in the classes that I was interested in. So I would get like A's in the, in the sciences that I had taken. But I would get D's in the classes that everybody would take to get the A's in. But I just wasn't interested in them. So I wouldn't mm. show up and I wouldn't study for tests and things like that. So my academic, like my GPA was never that great. So I, I just knew that like med school wasn't the route for me. And so I ended up pivoting to a, a double major in film and psychology. And that led to me getting a job as a journalist out of college. I, I worked for a TV network in the US um, that I did for six years. I did that, um, you know, and, and the topics that I covered there really ran the gamut. But I would always try to bring it back to health whenever I had the opportunity to do that. Six years into that role, my experience there kind of like plateaued. I learned everything that there was to learn and I left. And in my personal life, that was when um, my mom got sick. My mom who was the person I'd been the closest to in life. You know, I'm, I'm the oldest child in a very small family. Mm -hmm. I've got two younger brothers and I, I was always incredibly close to my mom. And um, in about the year 2011, 2012, she started to show the earliest symptoms of what would ultimately be diagnosed as a form of, of dementia, like a rare neurodegenerative condition called Lewy body dementia. And um, I had no prior family history of any kind of neurodegenerative condition. So, you know, the word Alzheimer's disease wasn't, or the, 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 the condition wasn't even in my lexicon. Is your mom fairly healthy? She was not um, overweight. She was a, a thin and health conscious woman her, her whole life. But um, She's still alive? No, she passed oh, okay. away three years ago. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, she passed away actually uh, due to pancreatic cancer. So she mm -hmm. had a very tragic, the last decade of her life, eight years of her life were, were really hard. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she was young when she first started to show these symptoms. And so I couldn't chalk up what I was seeing to old age. And uh, it threw me, it was like a curveball, right? Like to, to me and my family. And because I was in between jobs, I had the the privilege of being able to, start accompanying her to doctor's appointments. I would fly home to New York City, which is, you know, because I was I had been living in LA at the time. And I was I I relished getting to spend more and more time with my mom. And so I would go to, with her to these doctor's appointments in New York City, which as I mentioned is where I'm from. And you know, New York is a like when you live in Manhattan, you ha have access to some pretty great medical yeah. care, right? So I would go with my mom to doctor's appointment after doctor's appointment. And nobody could give us a clear sense of what it was that she had. Now, granted, her symptoms were atypical, right? She wasn't like textbook, like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease for that matter. But um, we were met with 
what I have come to call diagnose and adios. Basically, a prescription would like offer their opinion, scribble down a few notes on a prescription pad, send us on our way. One one doctor, one psych- psychiatrist actually, actually thought that all of my mom's symptoms were attributable to depression, which I think is you know, often the case, especially with middle-aged women, you know, one in four women over the age of 40 these days is on some kind of antidepressant drug. Yeah. And so it actually took us having to go to Cleveland, Ohio, to the Cleveland Clinic, where she was diagnosed with a neurodegenerative condition for the first time. And she was prescribed drugs for both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Mm-hmm. And so that to me was like the line in the sand where I became not just interested, but like obsessed with learning everything I possibly could about diet and lifestyle factors and how they might predispose us to these kinds of chronic conditions that we now see people all over the world suffering from, right? Mm. But I focused on dementia and specifically Alzheimer's disease because it's the most common form of dementia. So there's the the, you get the most sort of research on it. Yeah. Um, But under the purview of like brain health, you've got cardiovascular health, you've got all these different, you know, sort of fields, which are typically siloed off in, in, in the world of medicine, right? Mm-hmm. But for me, I just developed this voracious appetite to understand everything that I possibly could. And I'm not a medical doctor. I didn't go through the academic route, just to be super clear. But, um, but you know, this is a journey that began about 10 years ago for me. And, uh, and it's going to continue for the rest of my life. Like, the, my mom was robbed from me and my family. And I think that in, in large part, um, it was due to some kind of toxic exposure in her environment, whether that was via diet, whether that was via her lifestyle. As I mentioned, she wasn't she wasn't overweight, but you know, my mom's generation, they didn't exercise very mm-hmm. regularly, right? They, um, my mom wasn't a big believer in, and I'm not saying that this is the cause, but she wasn't a big believer in like organic, you know, so we bought conventional produce, you know, my whole, my whole upbringing. So, I mean, that's an area that I've Yeah, it wasn't like you had something you really point to, like, oh, she was 100 pounds overweight, maybe that was the issue, or she right. was a prize fighter or something where you're like- Hitting the head. Yeah, part yeah. of the occupation, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's not it's not just like one thing, and I'll never know what, what caused this for my mom, but it's led to me ultimately having to leave no stone unturned as I, as I investigate, like what, you know, what it is about our, di- our diets and our lifestyles that have become essentially toxic. You mentioned she was health conscious. So that actually makes me curious because she was paying attention to her health. She must have been paying attention to different things. What was she doing at that time that was conventionally the, I guess, um, information on health that she was actually partaking in? Yeah, I mean, that's a a great question. She was was health conscious and she also... The the lore of my family was that her dad had died due to heart disease. So my mom was particularly attuned because she thought her dad died due to heart disease, to the messaging surrounding what it meant to be, what, what it meant to eat a heart healthy diet. What's up, Power Project family? It's time to stop dressing like you're a fucking preschooler and step your game up by <laughs> checking out the Ori clothing. Now, I'm not one to talk. I wear a fucking pink hat that has a dog on it, but at the end of the day, at least my shirt and shorts are popping. So head to Viore because they have great stuff for your top and your bottom. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, you guys got to head over to viore.com slash power project. That's V U O R I dot com slash power project and you guys will automatically receive 20 percent off your order links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes let's get back to the podcast okay in the yeah. 70s 80s and 90s right grains so which was like yeah low fat low fat mm-hmm. high grain low saturated fat low cholesterol diets right if it had a red heart healthy logo on it in the mm-hmm. supermarket you could guarantee that it was at some point it made its way th- you know into my house mm. And so I grew up consuming, you know, like I just, I remember vividly, like the, the huge plastic tub of, uh, of corn oil that we always had by the stove. I remember we never had uh, actual butter in my fridge. Mm-hmm. It was always margarine in those, in those yellow plastic tubs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because it was the heart healthy alternative to animal fats, right? Yeah. Um, so many examples. I mean, my mom, my mom would load up on grain products because they had no, you know, they were either low fat or had no saturated fat and were cholesterol free. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, my mom was also um, a passionate animal rights advocate. So my mom made a very low animal product diet in general. Um, she never ate any beef ever. Um, I, you know, very rarely, if ever, did I see her consume eggs because of the cholesterol contained mm-hmm. in the in the yolks. And uh, occasionally, she would eat lean chicken breast. Um, she would eat like fish, you know, because fish was we've known for some time has a as a cardioprotective. Um, effect. So yeah, that's kind of like how she lived, you know, Mm -hmm. high grain, low fat, generally low, uh, definitely low saturated fat, 
low cholesterol. And when you cut those kinds of things out of your diet, especially the red meat and all that stuff, what do you replace it with? You replace it with ultra processed, like modern food products, like high grain products, right? And also yeah. like for those decades, like that's when the food pyramid was uh, in service, which has now been retired, thankfully. But I mean, that was a, that was a paradigm that implored Americans every day to consume seven to 11 servings of, of grains, right? Yeah. And you look at like, you look at the illustrated version of the food pyramid and it's like pasta, bread products and things like that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I was raised and, you know, that's how she ate the majority of her life. And, um, you know, again, I can't like point my finger at her diet and say, that's what caused what my mom had, Yeah, but it certainly wasn't protective. The OG yeah. pyramid. Well, and there's... um. What percentage of the population are they starting to estimate that is going to potentially run into Alzheimer's and dementia at this point? Like I've I've heard some staggering numbers. I don't know if you've heard. Yeah. Well, today, if you make it to the age of 85, you have a 50% chance. So that's like a coin toss. Like you want to know your odds of developing Alzheimer's disease? It's a coin toss. And this is U.S. only? Or this is US. US. This is US. Yeah, yeah. And I believe they've estimated by like 2030 be half the population by the age of 65. Yeah. Yeah, what is it? I think today in the U.S. there's about 6 million people with Alzheimer's disease alone, and that number by the year 2050 is set to be triple that. Wow. So 6, 12, 18, yeah, 18 million people. So there's something, some, something's happening. Something in the environment. Up. Yeah, it's something in the environment. Yeah. I mean, and that, that could, the same could be said for um, cardiovascular disease mm -hmm. rates, I mean, cancer, you know, incidents. Do you think they're all connected? Do you think, because there's some people that believe that, uh, heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's are kind of all the same thing-ish. Yeah. Well, there's. it depends on who you ask and where you look. But generally, um, I mean, we know that we're becoming more insulin resistant as a society and more obese. You know, obesity is a huge problem. And if you are obese, your risk for developing certain cancers, for heart disease, for dementia um, skyrockets, right? As opposed to somebody who is at a normal healthy weight. Um and so, yeah, everything everything does seem to be connected, whether it's insulin resistance. But there are, with regard to dementia specifically, it's only as of the past couple of years that we've been able to talk about it as a potentially preventable condition. Um, the 2020 Lancet uh, Commission determined that there are about 12 modifiable risk factors for the development of um, dementia. And so modifiable risk factors are risk factors that fall under your control. Mm -hmm. And just to contrast that, you have non-modifiable risk factors. So non-modifiable risk factors would be, for example, your age, your gender. If you're a female, your risk is twice that of a male's. Um, and your, uh, your age, your genes, and um, yeah, your gender and your genes. So, and genes is one of, uh, is, is one of these areas where you know, we're just sort of at the tip of the iceberg in terms of understanding all the different ways that genes play a role. But the most well-defined Alzheimer's risk gene is called the APOE4 allele, and about one in four people carry it. And if you have that in the U.S., that puts you at anywhere between two and 14-fold increased risk. But then there's this concept of polygenic risk. So you have different genes that we have yet to describe that might, you know, like in you cancel out the APOE4 allele. So it's super complicated stuff. Was, real quick question about that APOE4 allele. Is that yeah. something that like if you did a 23andMe could pop up or is it you need more specific testing for that? No, that's uh, that's actually very easy to, to figure out whether or not you carry that. Okay. But the, like the recommendations that I make don't vary, don't, don't really um, change depending on whether or not you carry that gene. I might make different like recommendations like in terms of like dietary fats because there's some, you know, thinking that APOE4 carriers don't um, metabolize saturated fats as well. Okay. But, um, but in general, I think like the, the modifiable risk factors are where we really have agency. And that's where I think like most people should focus their efforts, not on like what gene do I have, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, what do you think some of the most agreeable things just in, uh, in, terms of our, in terms of our health? Like what are things that are, uh, I guess, the lowest hanging fruit that yeah. are modifiable, you think? Yeah. Well, I definitely, I think today, you know, people just, they're eating too many what are called ultra processed foods. I think that's the big thing. Like when I first started, I was more interested in like, you know, like macronutrients and, and you know, whether it was, whether it was like low carb or low fat, that was like more, um, more uh, harmful. Um, 
you know, and then you can get granular with like the the plant based versus the carnivore arguments, and the and our seed oil is good, our seed oil is bad. But I think ultimately, like the 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 lowest hanging fruit is to just eat fewer ultra processed foods and to focus your diet more on on the minimally processed whole foods, like the foods that are in around the perimeter of the supermarket. And I know people like listening to this. Your audience is incredibly savvy. They're like, well, that's not rocket science. But that the reality is like. Today, 60% of the calories that your average person is consuming, your average adult is consuming, come from these like packaged processed convenience foods. Mm -hmm. And that number is even higher for children. For children, it's like 70%, yeah, and which is insane. If you could just, cha just change that percentage. Just yeah. whatever way you can. Yeah. In some small degree that you can. And then maybe over time you progress to uh, improving it more and more over time. Yeah, improving diet quality. Like diet quality, I think, is like a massive thing. Like the, the, the diets of most Americans are of, of such poor quality and you know there are obviously like there are other there are factors here that are that play a role that are outside of you know that can be outside of people's control like where they live, food access and things like that which you know is important but generally once somebody becomes aware of the fact that food quality is important it also influences the amount of food that you eat right like food mm -hmm. quality plays a huge role in terms of like our our drive to eat mm -hmm. yeah if you were to change that 60% coming from processed food and turned it down to 50% over time, you'll, you'll uh, be encouraged to eat less yeah. because you have better quality food. You can make an argument for protein leveraging and maybe you're eating less calories and over time you're eating less and less junk. Yeah, absolutely. Like there was that um, Kevin Hall study, uh, I believe it was 2018, that found that when people were given access only to an ultra processed diet, they tended to consume a calorie surplus when eating to satiety, right? Of about 500 additional calories. Whereas when it was a, a crossover trial, when those people were given access only to a minimally processed food diet, mm. they ended up eating at like a 300 calorie uh, deficit. So right there, that's like an 800 calorie swing determined purely by the quality of the food that you're eating. So a lot of people, when they are on this like weight loss journey and they present to their doctors or their dietitians and they hear the advice, like just eat less, move more. I think what mm. they're not realizing is that what you're eating influences how much you're eating. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, I think, like a, a probably the lowest hanging fruit. What were the numbers standpoint. with kids? You mentioned kids. You mentioned uh, adults around 60% with processed food. Do you know the numbers for kids? Uh, it's, clo it's like closer to 70%. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, kids, and I what also pops into my head is our, our elderly. Mm -hmm. I think they also have like really poor food choices. I think, I don't really know what it's like to as you get older, but I think... Uh, a lot of people start to complain of like their digestion and they have a hard time with like maybe something like a steak doesn't go down as smooth, uh, you know, as you get older. So they tend to stick to grains. They tend to, they tend to stick with the uh, kind of quick, easy, cheap foods. Yeah. Peeps, we love bringing you all this fitness information and we also want to help bring that information to more people. So if you could help us out, hit that rep subscribe button and then hit the notification bell and we'll continue to bring you the heat. And I won't whisper in your ear. <laughs> Talk to you guys later.